have your Bibles, open them up to Genesis chapter 2. Chris, thank you for all the hard work you and all the musicians do every week. We love singing here, and we've got some good songs that we work through, and I love it every Sunday. I was able to go to college here in Florida. I graduated from the University of North Florida, and there aren't too many Ospreys around. I think uh, every once in a while I'll see someone from UNF make their way into the church, and we just kind of smile and go, Osprey Nation, and it's fun. But uh, not many Ospreys around. That was our mascot. I was amazed how much an assault on faith the college experience was for me in the, the 90s. Uh, I minored in religion, and so I dealt with it. I, I faced a lot of uh, classes that dealt with the Bible and dealt with Christianity. And, and so I had a lot of professors that definitely were not believers and made it clear in their teaching what they had to share. Uh, I had religious professors acclaiming me that Jesus, the Jesus I knew at church and was raised with at church, was an invention by his followers. That the, the Jesus we worship in church is just an invention of the early church. That the real Jesus, the more I began to study their version of Jesus, was more of like a, a weed-smoking hippie when I began to understand their version of Jesus. And honestly, it began to reflect exactly what they looked like the more I began to hang around them and understand them. I had a professor call out my own home church by name and my own pastor by name and tell me what a problem that my church was and my pastor was to the city of Jacksonville, Florida. And I remember what a blessing college is to, to have such gifts. I had professors that tried to show uh, classes uh, supposed contradictions in the Bible. And so one of the projects I had in one of my classes was to go home and to study different portions of Scripture and to point out to my professor all of the contradictions that, that were in those passages. And so I thought that was fascinating. One of the areas of discussion in college is a passage we're going to look at this morning in our Bibles in Genesis chapter 2. I was taught in college at University of North Florida that Genesis chapters 1 and Genesis chapter 2 contradict each other. And so I'm going to deal with that in our sermon this morning in our time together. And if you have your Bibles open there, let's stand for the reading of the Word of God. We're going to just look at a few short verses because we have much to say about this passage that has caused so much print and controversy and hundreds of years of debate and study. Genesis chapter 2 verse 4 reads, and God's Word says, These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. And a mist was going up from the land, and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. Let me pray for us. Father, I'm thankful for your word. And I ask as we study it and read it and hear it, that we would tune our hearts into it, that we would turn off anything that would distract us, Father, from hearing from you. And as we hear your word, we would receive it well. It would take root in our hearts. It would bear fruit in us. And that, Father, you would mold us into the image of your Son. And that we would be growing in our faith. That we would not be dying on the vine, but Father, there there would be an abundance of fruit in us as we abide in Christ. Bless us today to yield to you and to grow accordingly. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. Now you may have read those verses and thought, well, what's the deal? What's the big, you know, what is it? I don't see what's going on. Uh, Let me, let me explain and slow it down and we'll, we'll have a bit of application and points from this. Uh, After chapter 1, where Moses gives us the seven days of creation in Genesis chapter 1, Moses now refocuses back in on day 6, the creation of man. What you have, though, is many people that read chapter 2 and read the way it's written, they will see two different and separate accounts of creation. And this is what many people believe in, that there are two differing versions of creation. And when they read Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2, My first point today should address that concern, and so let me give it to you. As we study deeper and look into God's creation of mankind, the first point today is you want to survey the unity of Scripture. Survey the unity of Scripture. Scripture is unified. Scripture is not divided. There are no contradictions anywhere in the Bible. 
there are some areas of Scripture that take study and introspection to understand, well, how does this reconcile with that? But there are no contradictions. And if it is God's Word and God wrote the Word of God and God is truth, there is no contradiction. And so we see this and believe this as we study Scripture. And so before I dive into the debate and into that question, let me just give you a bit of an interpretive key, starting in verse 4, where it says, These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. You'll find that phrase, that is the key phrase, these are the generations, that is a key phrase throughout the book of Genesis. It's an interpretive key to the book of Genesis. You'll find that phrase throughout the book ten times. As a matter of fact, the very word Genesis itself comes from the Greek word that we translate generations. The generations, these are the generations. The Greeks translated the Old Testament into Greek uh, before Jesus' time. It's called the Septuagint, the Greek translation. And the very Greek word they used right here uh, for generations, if you want to learn it, it's jignesthani or jignesthai, good luck. It derives from uh, the meaning of the word generation, which is to give birth to. And it's from that word we get the word Genesis, which is the very title of the book. But you'll find, though, that as you read the book of Genesis, ten different times, these are the generations, that phrase will occur. Five of the times it occurs, it deals with records in history before the time of the patriarchs. The patriarchs are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then another five times it deals with the patriarchs. And so it's, it's just a nice interpretive key for those of you that love to kind of map out a book. It's a good way to map out the book of Genesis. When Genesis 2 verse 4 states these are the generations, it means these are the events that followed from God's creation of the heavens and the earth. So here are the events now that follow. And so what do we do with those that will teach that Genesis 1 and 2 are opposing and contradicting accounts of creation? What we actually have here is two different accounts of the same event. When you study it deeper and understand the language and the vernacular of the Hebrew being used, you find that Moses is zooming in now on the same event, but he's going into day 6 in greater detail, the creation of man in greater detail. The greatest problem people have with this passage and the, where they will see two accounts of creation is verse 5. So let's look at verse 5 carefully together as a church. Verse 5 says, When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. The problem with, that many have with this verse is this verse seems to be saying there's no plants at all, but God's creating man on this day. And that is the context of verse 5. God is about to create man, and it's at a moment where there's no plants. But in chapter 1, we read that there were plants. That God did make the plants before he made man. So how do we reconcile this, and what does this actually mean? And how do we deal with this? Scholars and students of the Bible will make the argument that this verse contradicts Genesis chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. Where God made the earth sprout with plant life. And on the third day, by saying that vegetation occurred. Only after the creation of man on the sixth day, uh, which we see that in, in verse 27 of chapter 1. So on this basis alone, some have declared Genesis 1 is non-historical to keep it from contradicting Genesis 2 verse 5. You have those that have said, well, Genesis 1 is more poetic, so it's not really historical. And they begin to throw out the historicity of Genesis 1. Let me just warn you, anytime you begin to throw out the historicity of these things, you open your door up to anything that comes down the pipe. And this has allowed many to go down the pipe where they affirm theistic evolution, that God used evolution. I do not believe that this opens that door at all. So, again, how do we reconcile these passages and what exactly do they mean? To reconcile them, let me give you some Hebrew and tell you what some, what's being said in Genesis 2. The Hebrew word for small plant in Genesis 2 verse 5 in your ESV Bible, it's translated as the word bush. It's the Hebrew word siach. And that word is not found at all in chapter 1. And the reason is these verses do not describe the same event. Uh, the reason is these verses do not describe, let me, let me explain what I'm saying. According to the eminent Jewish scholar, Umberto Casudo, Genesis 2 verse 5 refers to the kind of plant that you find in agriculture that did not exist in the world until man began to till the ground. And he's making a case for the Hebrew word meaning that, which in its study, that is what that word is used for and where it shows up. It's mankind tilling the ground, 
using agriculture to bring forth certain things that only happen after agriculture. Man began to till the ground after his expulsion from Eden because of sin, which is why the expression in verse 5, plant of the field, occurs in this verse and also after the curse in Genesis 3.18. So again, this is referring to the kind of food that man has to work hard to cultivate among the thorns and the thistles. Before the fall, man lived in a perfect garden. Man didn't have to work at all with the ground to bring forth fruit from the trees and other seed-bearing plants. After the fall, man was consigned to hard labor and agriculture. Uh, today, we're very blessed to have Walmart and, and uh, all sorts of restaurants. We just can go and eat what we want. But this reminds us that Genesis 2, verse 5 does not contradict Genesis 1, 11, and 12. And so Genesis 2, verse 5 could be read to say, in the time before agriculture and rain and, and the tilling of the land by mankind. Look at the verse again, and you, you should see it now. When no bush of the field was yet in the land, no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, because the Lord had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. His emphasis is this is before mankind. This is before the agriculture, before the ground began to be worked on. Another area, though, where people have seen contradiction. And let me address this because this shows up, and this is a bigger deal. Critical scholarship has made much of the different names of God that show up in Genesis chapter 2 and Genesis chapter 1. In chapter 2, verse 4, if you look at verse 4 again, it's speaking of the Lord God uh, in the verse, but it uses the covenant name for God uh, translated from Yahweh in our Bibles, in our English Bibles. In Genesis chapter 1, we have a, a different word being used for the name of God. It's the word Elohim in chapter 1. And then chapter 2, verse 4, you have Yahweh. And so this has led insane levels of scholarship to lead to source theories about maybe it wasn't one man, Moses, that wrote all this. Maybe there was a group that, that really liked Elohim, and they wrote the Elohim parts of the law. And then you had the, the Yahwehist group, the, the Y group or the J group, and they wrote, they wrote all of those sections of the law. And this led to what we call the, the JEDP hypothesis, documentary hypothesis, that there are four major sources to the law. How many of you, by a show of hands, have ever heard anything about this, what I'm talking about? All right, I see a lot of hands in the room. Many of you have heard about hypothesis theory. And, and so this is something I also learned in college. I learned when I got to college, Moses didn't write the first five books of the Bible. It was written later after the exile, and it was written by five different groups or four different source groups. And the groups became known as J-E-D-P, the different groups, each letter standing for the name of the group. J was the, uh, the, the uh, Jehovah group, the Yahweh group. Uh, e is Elohim group. D was the Deuteronomy group, the, the group that just was focused on the law. And P was the priestly group. And these four groups put together in about 400 B.C. what we have in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Well, that doesn't fly at all with what I was raised with in church. And so I began to study this, and I began to research this. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll go to seminary. And the Lord had called me into the ministry, so I made my way over to seminary and began to learn what uh, the seminary was teaching about these things. Um, and when I made it to seminary, I had Dr. Daniel Block. He was my professor of Old Testament at Southern Seminary. I'll never forget the first week I got to his class on Old Testament 1. I thought, he's going to address JEDP, and I'm going to hear it. And what he did for an entire week, church, is he taught us JEDP and defended it in front of us as fact. And I thought, well, this is, this is trouble. I, I don't believe this stuff. So I began to ask my other friends that were at Southern. I said, well, what are we to do with Dr. Block? Is he a liberal? What is this? And they said, no, 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 no. Go back to class on next Monday and, and buckle your seatbelts. And hold on. I thought, well, what is about to unfold? My friend Chris Abner, who had gone through Block's class, he said, Block does that. He'll defend it. He'll teach it for a week. And then in the next week, just, just watch what he does. So I went back Monday. I sat down. I had my notes ready. There was a kid that had already dropped out of the class because he thought, this is so liberal. I'm out of here. And Daniel Block, for another full week, began to dismantle JEDP. He dismantled it in such a way you would have to be a fool to believe it after hearing all of his argumentation. And like an expert lawyer, he said, last week I gave you the greatest cases critical scholarship has ever given us to believe that there were source theories and, and different groups that led to the writing of the law. What I'm going to show you this week is a case for why Moses wrote it in the time in which we believe that the Bible tells us that he wrote it. He knocked it out of the park. I've never heard such a dismantling in my entire life. 
of any system. And I thought as I listened to it, who in their right mind could ever hold such a EDT? Who could ever do it? In the late 90s, there were still people teaching it in the colleges. I'll have you know, in the early 2000s, everyone, even the most liberal scholars in America and around the world, began to abandon it. Well, why is this? And this is something Daniel Block began to show us. He said, listen, in the, the early 80s through the late 90s, they began to do surveys of these books in the Bible, and they began to do unity studies. We had computers that were able to take all the language and, and run it through systems, and we, were began, we began to discover and realize literary unity of different books of our Bibles, teaching us that these are written by singular authors, teaching us that these are written by folks that uh, have their own vocabulary, their own grammatical style, their own use of the language. And what they found when they ran the first five books of the Bible through uh, these computer generations and began to figure out the unity of it, there was one solo author of all five books. They had a very similar vocabulary, very similar grammar style throughout the first five books. He began to show us case after case where all four source materials that had been taught critically were in fact one author, Moses. And he began to build the case that just, again, blew us away. And I'll give you three of the arguments that he gave, and then we'll move on. But that was the first argument. It was the, the literary unity study that began where they found out and discovered there was one vocabulary, one grammar, and one form that conclusively supported one author as its source and not four. The one that I loved the most is he went into all the Egyptian loan words that were in the law. There are more than 50 words in the first five books of the Bible that are borrowed words from Egyptian. And think about this. If this were written in the 400 B.C. era, it should have really no Egyptian loan words going on. But what do you know about Moses in particular that would tell us that if he wrote these books, he might know a little bit about Egyptian? He was trained in it. He was studied. He, he learned these things. Let me show you one example of this. Exodus 2, 3. And you'll have this first, I hope, on the screen. Exodus 2, verse 3. When she could hide him no longer, she took him, she took for him a basket made of bulrushes and dabbed it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the river bank. In the original Hebrew, when you study it, the words, though, for bulrushes, reeds, and river bank are all Egyptian words. Borrowed words transliterated into Hebrew. That only makes sense if it was written by someone that knew Egyptian pretty well. That only makes sense if it was written during a time in which they claim to have been in Egypt. And so we see uh, at least the Egyptian loan words, these things line up well to, again, a singular author who knew Egyptian. And we have this in our Bibles. Look at Acts 7, verse 22. And Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. And he was mighty in his words and in his deeds. And so we find those things showing up in the law consistently. The third thing that they realized when they began to study all the near, uh, near Eastern religious works of other religions, and there was revealing in each of those works, all of them, that the, that the different religions would be using similar usage of multiple names for their gods. And so for Moses to use multiple names for the singular God, it was just not anything out of the ordinary. This is common in all studied religious works. And so there's no reason to believe Moses did not write these books. So I share that today to say, listen, the Bible is united. And that we can rationally believe in what we read in Scripture to be coming from God and through the Holy Spirit filling men such as Moses to write the Bible. So in summary, the first five books of the Bible have survived at least the JEDP theory, 200 years of critical liberal scholarship that has tried to discredit it. And it stands firm as the work of one author writing precisely within the time period we would expect him to write, which is around the 15th century B.C. 15th century, not 4th century, 15th. Church, all this, if you are glazing over and crusting up with some sleep, let me just say this to you. Our Bibles stand firm under scrutiny. They stand firm. There is legit reason to believe the Word of God as it is delivered and written to us. There's no reason to yield an inch of Scripture to any critical scholarship that would come along and try to discredit it. One of the strongest reasons you might choose to believe in the Bible, if you're here today and you're a skeptic or maybe an atheist, if you are, I'm glad you're here. Please come and ask questions. We love talking to you. But here's one of the reasons you may want to believe in Scripture and should believe in Scripture. It's beautiful and incredible unity. The Bible was written by more than 40 authors, 
on three different continents, three different languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek, and is written over a span of 1,600 years. But when you study it from page to page, from cover to cover, it has incredible unity about God and about all it presents. And it presents to us one grand story of God loving humankind by sending His Son, Jesus, to die for sinners. It's all one grand story of God's love for us. And, and so you see that in of, of Jesus. And so that is a reason to uphold and to believe in the Bible as being written by God. You want to survey the unity of Scripture as you study deeper into God's creation of mankind. The second thing is you want to see mankind uniquely formed by God. Look at verse 7, if we'll just move through this. Then the Lord God formed the man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. You know, when God created the stars, the sea, and the land, he merely spoke them into being, and they became. He just said, let there be land, and there it was. Let there be light, there it was. When God is creating man now, he is forming with his own hands mankind. The Hebrew word used for formed is used for a potter molding his clay. And so you must know, for every human being, we are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God. We see that in chapters 1 and chapter 2. There is too much at play in the way God has formed us that, that we are not here by random chance. We're not here by accident. I hope you know that your bodies are extremely sophisticated. You could spend millions and millions of dollars and not replace what God's already given you. We have our eyes, which are more sophisticated, sorry to say the word, trying to get it out, more sophisticated than any camera system in the whole world, our eyes. They've never been able to replicate the colors our eyes are still able to pick up. Now, television sets are getting better, right? They're getting better and better. They're still not able to convey all of the spectrum and color that our eyes can take in, which is so cool. We can see more colors than the screens we look at are able to reproduce. Our brains are more sophisticated than any computer system in the world. There is no computer system anywhere in the world that comes close to what our brains are capable of computing and processing in, in the level and the spectrum at which they are able to work. Now, AI is advancing. We're in the, the AI revolution right now where everything we have known and loved is being uh, infused with artificial intelligence. Uh, we have AI, and it's been around for a while, where it's just trying to help us write whatever we're trying to write. Pretty soon, AI is just going to take over, and we're just going to be you know, sitting on the couch, and our AI will just live on and do whatever. But it's pretty crazy. It has a long way to go, though, right, to get even close to the reasoning ability and functions of the human brain. What's happening with any AI system you're using right now is AI is being trained to understand how humans think and work. And so every system we work with that is using AI is listening and watching closely and learning and being trained. Well, if you can take any organ there is and study it closely, and if you study any organ of the human body closely, you're going to see as you study that one organ such an intelligent design behind any organ, any of them. Such systems could never have evolved because their need, their need is strong for interdependency for them to run and exist. Let me give an example of what that means. Interdependency. This is an argument I've used quite a bit, and many of you have heard this argument. For example, your lungs, your brain, and your heart are interdependent. All three of them need each other to work at all. So here's a great question to write down and ask any of your evolutionary evolutionist friends, and maybe if you hold to this, let me ask you this question. If those systems evolved, which system evolved first? Did the brain evolve first? Did the lungs evolve first? Or did the heart evolve first? Because if any of them evolved first, guess what? It wouldn't work. All of them are interdependent. They need each other to operate. There's no way in which, okay, let's say it though, hypothetically, for them to work at all and for the, that whole process to make sense, Here's the just rational outcome. All three of those systems would have to have evolved at the exact same time to work as they do. So let me ask you a, just a nice rational question for those of you rational thinkers. What is the scientific mathematical probability of all three of those systems evolving from random chance and working perfectly as they work in our human bodies? What is the likelihood of that? What is the probability of that? Is it a foolish idea to believe that God made us fearfully and wonderfully? I don't think it's foolish at all. I think it is more rational. 
to believe in a creator than to believe that these systems just evolved from nothing into the working systems that they are. And do you see as you look at the human anatomy that we are able to study, the amazing handiwork of God, that you are formed, God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. The third final point is you study deeper into God's creation of mankind. You want to sense man's full dependence upon God. And first it says here, he breathed into our nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living creature. It might say in your translation, man became a living soul, a living being. God created us and then he breathed life into us. And mankind began to to work and to live. We are dependent today still on God for breath. I think lungs are an amazing thing to study as we just talked about lungs a little bit. Uh, I'm not into scuba diving. I'm not as brave as some of you in this room are. Some of you love to scuba dive. You love to go down there where you just can pressurize well and you like to live with the fishes a little bit. Uh, Give me a snorkel. Let me just float on the surface, right? And just let me just float and see it. That's all I want to do. That, I'm safe on the surface, so leave me up there. I'm the snorkel guy. The boys and I were in the ocean last summer, and I had a snorkel that was acting up. We were out swimming and, and moving around, and my snorkel kept filling up with water. Every time I would take a breath, I would be struggling and fighting against the water that would fill up in my snorkel. I kept sucking salt water into my mouth, and that's no fun at all when you're out snorkeling. It became a bit exhausting because... Uh, The reality is we all need air. All of us need air. We can't last long without air. I don't know if you've ever tried to hold your breath for a long amount of time. I think a minute is about as far as I've ever made it my entire life. It amazes me, though, how God designed this world we live in perfectly to provide us with air. As much as we make claims that the, the rainforests are dying and we need to protect the earth and all these things, here's the deal. If you keep producing carbon monoxide, the earth is going to keep producing oxygen. These plants are going to keep making oxygen. We have 7 billion people alive in the world right now, more than 7 billion, all breathing the same air and all doing just fine right now. And the earth will continue to provide oxygen no matter how many billions of people come along. Have you ever, though, thanked God for the ability to breathe? Have you ever, in your prayers, said, God, thank you for my lungs. Thank you that I can breathe. Thank you that I can breathe well. I went to visit one of our members this week in a rehab center here in Orlando, and I said, what can I pray for for you? And this is so common if you know this gentleman. He said, don't pray for me. Pray for my roommate. My roommate is dying. He has pulmonary fibrosis, and he's slowly wasting away. His lungs are wasting away. He is struggling to breathe. And so we bowed our heads, and we prayed together for his roommate, for God to bless and to help his roommate through pulmonary fibrosis. Pulmonary is something that has taken a lot of uh, loved ones from this congregation. My mom passed away of pulmonary fibrosis a few years ago. Uh, Those of you involved in Campus Crusade for Christ, that's what took uh, Dr. Bill Bright. And it is one of those things where your lungs slowly begin to just waste away, where you drown, where you are unable to take in the oxygen you need. Church, let's thank God for our lungs today, for the ability to breathe. We read it at the beginning of the service, Acts 17.24. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. All that you have comes from God. Your very breath you're breathing right now is a gift from God. And there should be a reality that every breath we take, we say, God, thank you. Thank you for breath. Not only are we dependent upon God for breath, the the covenant word for God is used in this passage is the word Yahweh. Uh, You've heard uh, in Exodus chapter 3, it's when God says, okay, I'm going to tell Pharaoh that God sent me, but who do I say God is? And it's in chapter 3 that God reveals to the Israelites and to Pharaoh and everyone the covenant name. But it's used here in Genesis 2, and it's used throughout the scriptures. Let Let me just tell you where his name shows up as Yahweh in the law. Whenever God is dealing with us intimately in a personal level, a covenant love level, the word Yahweh will show up in the original Hebrew, usually. Whenever God is creatively dealing with the forces of the world, it's usually the word Elohim that shows up in those settings. It's not true in all cases. Matter of fact, in verse 4 in this passage, when he's actually saying the Lord God, he's using Elohim and Yahweh in the same verse. 
as you study this, he does that quite a bit throughout this chapter. But Yahweh is there. And the word Yahweh, when you study the covenant meaning of the word Yahweh, it's the part of God's nature that comes through the name that he desires a covenant relationship with his people. God built us for relationship and really designed us for a relationship with him. And so let's work that out just for a moment. We are dependent upon God in relationship. We are dependent, though, on relationships with other people. God built us that way. You, from birth, needed other people to make it your first few years. You could not have made it on your own. We need each other. Uh, we need each other relationally. We were built for relationships. No man is an island who's in, in this room. You need friends. You need people you can talk to and be around and be open to. We have an innate need as human beings to know each other and to be known. And we have a need for friends. Everyone has that. God made us for this, and we see this. And it flows out of the Trinity as you study the first two chapters of Genesis. And so you need relationships with other people. If you're finding it hard to make relationships, let me encourage you to come to church events, uh, come to mission trips, get involved in service days and events, show up early, leave late, and shake a hand. Get to know those around you. Introduce yourself. And you'll find that there will be in your local church friends that God has prepared for you to meet. We do have a codependency, though, that, we, that is healthy, that I think is to be fleshed out for Christians in their local church. And that is something that is put there by God. But listen, deeper than that, you have a need in your soul and in your spirit to know God and have a relationship with God. As God breathes into man's nostrils, Moses uses the covenant name Yahweh, emphasizing an intimate and personal relationship with man. And it's not that God needs us. But it is that in our heart of hearts, we truly need Him. Mankind cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You were created in such a way that you must know and seek and grow to know your Creator. That is where true fulfillment and purpose and mission is found. That is our true existence in this world is to know God and glorify God. And until we know God, and begin to glorify God. We have missed out on our purpose in this world. And I would argue, until you know God and are glorifying God, you're really missing out on joy. You're missing out on purpose, on your work, your calling, your mission. So how can I know God? What is the way in which I can know God? It's through His Son, Jesus Christ. God provided a way for us to have access to Himself and in a relationship with Him through His Son, Jesus Christ. And if I can connect this passage that we've studied today to the Lord Jesus... Let me give you 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 45 through 49. It's a passage where Paul himself connects the dots. Paul, reading our passage, connects us to Jesus in 1 Corinthians 15, 45. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. So Adam showed up in the world first, even though Jesus was uh, you know, around co-eternal with the Father. Verse 47, the first man was from the earth. He was a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And then, as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. He's contrasting the first Adam, who is our forefather, to the second Adam, who is Jesus Christ who came to us from heaven, who is a life-giving spirit, as he describes them here in verse 45. And as we grow in Christ, we are made in the image of Christ, and we become in his likeness, just a, a resemblance of Jesus. Where the first Adam would fail and sin, and we'll read about that soon. Jesus, the second Adam, never failed. And so this passage looks back to Genesis 2, verse 7. And it notes that Adam became a living being by means of the breath that God blew into him. Here's the deal. When Jesus Christ showed up, God's own son, he did not need anyone granting him life. He's the one that gives life. He's the life giver. And this means that we can enter into this new life. And just like Adam was given life in the garden, we have this life that God gives us in Christ. Where we become brand new creations. The old things are passed away. All things are become new. I think about uh, Jesus being a life-giving spirit. What he told the woman at the well in John 4. 
and it, even in John 7, 37, 38, uh, where he kind of reached its fulfillment, where he said this in John 7, 37, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Here's the reality. When you come to faith in Jesus Christ, Christ breathes brand new life into you. He indwells you from that point on into all of eternity. God the Holy Spirit indwells you, and out of your heart flow rivers of living water through the Lord Jesus. It's a new creation. It's conversion. It is beautiful. And every man in the world is born by the first Adam. Every man on earth. If you're walking around, you you definitely are a human being, and you are here by the first Adam, but not every man on the earth has been born again by the second Adam, Jesus. It's our hope as a church that you would be born again, and you would have a spiritual birth, because there is new life today available through Jesus Christ. He is the one who gives this life-giving spirit that indwells us and pushes us forward. Are you in this covenant relationship with God? Are you in this intimate fellowship with him through his son, Jesus Christ? And if not, we invite you to come to faith in Christ today and to believe on him. And you'll find this well springing up in you into eternal life. It'll, it'll be as true for you as it is for anyone that comes to Jesus Christ. I want to conclude but just by answering the question, how can our faith survive college experiences? And how can our faith survive in a culture that is becoming more and more hostile to faith and to people of faith? Maybe you've never wrestled with how to interpret Genesis chapter 2, verses 4 through 7. Uh, but let me just say, wherever you're at and wherever you're journeying through, if you're struggling to grow in your faith, let me give you three pointers to conclude today. Number one, stay connected to a church. Stay connected to a church. You need to be involved in a church, and you need to know the people in that church well. Let me throw this at you. If you had a deep question of the, of the faith and you did not know how to answer who in your local church could you go to and ask that question and have really good help with? Who do you know you, you can bring the tough questions to in your local church? And I want you to know, church, your questions are very safe here. We have a very safe environment for open questions. We love and welcome questions all the time. And so your questions are safe here. You can ask anything here you want to ask, and we will do our best to help you. second thing I would encourage you to do after staying connected to a church is to seek a genuine Christian fellowship. For 95% of you, your local church is the place for that connection of genuine Christian fellowship. There are many of you right now hearing this, sitting in the room, you're not involved in a small group, a small Sunday school class. You should be involved in one. And if you're ready to, to try that and to take next steps as you exit the service today, stop by the welcome table and ask for the sheet that has the printout of all the small groups. Look those small groups over and pray, God, which one would you have me to join? Because if I could say this to you, I would encourage you, if you only had one hour to give us on a Sunday, don't even come to the service, go to the small group. We have a lot of folks at work, and they will go to the small group, and they watch us online later, because in the small group, there's greater fellowship and accountability. There are people able to ask questions. How are you doing this week? How's, what are the prayer needs? What's happening in your life? And that happens at a deeper level in the small group that does not happen in the large group. For college students, usually it's a campus ministry. When I was in college, I had my small groups at the church. I connected with people in my church. But on my, my college campus, I was able to get involved in Campus Crusade for Christ. And I connected well and had a, just a, a flourishing, vibrant fellowship of, of believers my age there and also connectivity to older and wiser gentlemen that, that helped me along as I faced questions at college. Third thing you want to do is you want to search for good resources that address your questions. Two resources I'll give you, one that I used when I was in college that Campus Crusade pointed out to me. They pointed me to a website called everystudent.com, and everything I was dealing with in my classes had some professor with a Ph.D. that had written a paper on it on everystudent.com. So when I was struggling with JEDP, I was already able to go home and do my own research and learn conservative responses to liberal arguments against the faith, and I was equipped pretty well. Another one that many of you have used is Got Questions. Got Questions. I think it's gotquestions.org or .com. But you can look up Got Questions, and it's a wonderful, uh, valid website to help you address questions from Scripture. It's our hope today that if you do not know the Lord Jesus, that you've come to know the Lord Jesus. If you're in need of discussion with that, please talk to one of the pastors here at the church. We'd love to sit down with you and explain to you those things. If you are wrestling through any questions of your faith, you're going through a crisis of faith, let me encourage you as well to reach out to 
talk to some of the folks here in the room or to reach out to the staff. Well, let's sit down and let's have some discussions and work through those things. For all of us here, since God has made us and we are dependent on him, let us rest well in our God and let us go forward and enjoy him and glorify him together. And let us, by his strength, as Jesus tells us in John 15, apart from me, you can do nothing. Let us abide in our Lord and go forward and bear much fruit to glorify our Father. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that you have created us, that you have breathed life into us, that you have made us fearfully and wonderfully. Thank you that your word is intact and true, and it shall never pass away. And nothing can thwart the trustworthiness. It is inerrant. It is infallible. It will never lead us astray. May you give faith in, in a world that is growing hostile to faith. To those who are struggling to believe, may you help us forward with and through with our questions and struggles. May we find, as we study your word, may we find an anchor for our soul. Bless the studies in this church and bless those that are asking the questions. And I pray especially today, Lord, for those that are in need of Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, draw them unto salvation. May they feel that draw and come and trust on Jesus as an act of their will. And may you, may you bless their Christian growth. Father, may you help us as a church to grow strong and to stand firm and bold for these truths and proclaim them to a, a city that needs Jesus. Help us. Help us. And we ask all this in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to have a closing hymn of response to the word of God. As the musicians are going to come and, and as they will lead us in this closing hymn of response.